All right. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everybody all around the world watching our live Crypto Wednesday show again this week. And if you're uh, watching the recording, also thank you for watching this. My name is Sander de Bruin. Today I'm hosting together with my friend Gordon Einstein. Uh, I'm actually today located in Amsterdam, uh, the capital city of the Netherlands. Uh, for people that don't know me, my name is Sander de Bruin. Like I just described, I'm the chief investment officer of Iconic Digital Asset Management. It's a crypto fund based in the Netherlands. And together with my friend Gordon, we took the initiative a couple of uh, weeks ago to create a weekly crypto show where we want to contribute back to the industry and share latest insights, not only from ourselves, but also from several of our industry friends. And today we have got a really, really exciting uh, panel of guest speakers joining today's call. We will introduce them in, uh, in a little bit. But before we get started, I would just want to introduce quickly uh, my friend Gordon. Gordon, hi, nice to see you again, my friend. Where are you today in this world? Uh, today I am risking my life, and I hope this ends up not being ironic in retrospect. Uh, I am in New York City, in Manhattan. Um, we came here for just, had, we had to just uh, had to get some paperwork and everything else. So we flew in, and my wife and I, and we kind of made a few days of it. But this is the only time really I've been without a mask. So yes, I'm in beautiful Manhattan, you know, um, enjoying the city. It's kind of like a ghost town, but I've got my hotel room behind me. This is my new studio. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, th this is a globe trotting. Uh, you know, show. At least now I'm not up at 5:30 in the morning like usual. It's 8:30, so you know there's some small concession, but it's okay. Cool. And as always, I appreciate the Bitcoin poster behind you. I think that shows proper spirit. It's looking good, right? It's it sets the atmosphere right away from the first moment on. It, it does. It's fantastic. So, as you mentioned, I'm a crypto attorney or blockchain attorney, uh, and I'm happy to be doing this show with you and giving back to the community. Cool. Okay, so before we get started, and uh, we're going to introduce our guest speakers because we already have Gio, Fanny, and Bo on the call. Uh, just some side details for everybody that's watching the live uh, stream. We keep everybody's microphone from all the guests, we keep it uh, closed. So we have optimal sound system. If you have any relevant question that you want to bring on to the table and want the, one of the guest speakers or ourselves to answer that, then please make a comment, post your comments, post your questions. In the chat box, where our uh, kind and always professional uh, moderator, my friend Luke, will take care of the questions and deliver it to us. Uh, in the meantime, we are also recording this webinar, so afterwards we will upload it on our YouTube channels from ourselves and also from Iconic. So that's on uh, to give you some insights on, let's say, the house house rules. Well, that's it for that. Uh, let's let's start with the show. Let's do a quick intro. We first of all, in random order. I would like to introduce Giovanni to the call. Giovanni, thank you for joining the call. I think you're uh, streaming live from Puerto Rico at this moment. Uh, just to give the audience a little background, you're a tax attorney in Puerto Rico, you're licensed there. Um, but I would like to ask you, Giovanni, if you can share a little bit on your, uh, what you're currently uh, active with and also on your, on your history, what you've done in previous years and how you got involved into the crypto and blockchain industry. Of course, of course. Thank you for having me in the program. Um, good morning in my case, it's uh, 8.30 a.m. here in Puerto Rico. Um, like you mentioned, I am a, a tax attorney. I'm licensed in Puerto Rico. I'm also licensed in the U.S. tax court. Uh, my main practice has to do with incentives and some international taxation matters as well. Uh, the interaction of the foreign tax rules as they apply to Puerto Rico and the U.S. So that is, is, is all uh, summarized in assisting individuals and businesses established in Puerto Rico, uh, relocate operations in Puerto Rico, and then optimize their tax scenario through that. Um, it, regarding the blockchain industry, my first very early interaction was around uh, 2014. In that case, uh, we had a, uh, some investors that we're planning to use uh, an international financial entity, mm -hmm. uh, a vehicle to do an OTC desk in Puerto Rico. Um, I, I didn't understand, uh, I would say uh, more than three quarters of what all that meant back then, but we started uh, planning from the Puerto Rico perspective. Um, and, and then in that case, actually, that, the, 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 one of those ironic stories where 
that didn't happen. The investors pulled back, and then five years later, the investors were hitting themselves in the foot. Huh. Um, but uh, and then after that, uh, started working with other investors and individuals that relocated here. Um, always mention that uh, patient zero or the, the first crypto investor to move here, uh, Michael Turpin, uh, was my client. Um, patient zero. That, I, that that's a very aggressive reference to be using in these times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, true. Um, then yeah, after that, uh, practice started to grow um, with some, maybe a slower pace, and then obviously as the market uh, went up, then you know the, there there was a lot more interest uh, of the crypto community to move here. Mm -hmm. and, but then aside from crypto, other um, types of businesses, uh, a lot of tech companies. I have as clients and other service-based industries um, here in Puerto Rico. Um, that, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of background. Cool. And, and actually, Senator, let me, let me jump in one for, for one second. Sure. Let me thank Gio. You know, I think we neglected to mention the because we marketed it so much. The, the the theme of the show is Puerto Rico blockchain and business update third quarter 2020. Mm -hmm. So you know, we have such we have two students three such amazing guests, and they're so intimately tied with Puerto Rico. It kind of goes without saying, but then again, I wanted to say it. Um, you know, Puerto Rico is a, a worthy topic for our show just because it's a, such a fascinating sort of onshore, offshore hybrid jurisdiction. And I became aware of it in the crypto context <laughs> some years ago. Um, and whoever's got background noise, just make sure to mute yourself. The, but after having spoken with these guests uh, prior to the show, there's a lot to Puerto Rico that kind of extends beyond the crypto and blockchain. Now, obviously, that's going to be very important for our audience, but I just want to kind of give them both, and, you know, with Pedro, a shout out for they're going to be able to address the crypto and blockchain aspect, but we're also going to go deep dive about Puerto Rico, you know, its challenges, its prospects, its opportunities. So I just want to sort of set the table a little bit. So now I am going to stop and pass the ball back to you, and, and you can pass it to Bo. Thanks, Gordon. And now I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep the, the, the guys a little bit more, more quiet here, but we are actually on the, on the stock exchange. So this is a busy environment. You know, people are running around, selling stocks, selling whatever they can sell or buying whatever they can buy. Well, let, let, let me go to our second speaker of today. And I'm uh, grateful for the both of you. So Giovanni, but also Bo, for you to participate in, uh, in our Crypto Wednesday show. So first of all, thank you. Thank you on that. Bo, what I've read so far, what I've heard so far, is that your uh, professional background started in the banking and real estate industry, if I'm correct? Uh, yeah, primarily banking. I started with the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, okay. Well, maybe you can share a little bit more. Well, on, well on you're being fantastically modest, given <laughs> what we talked about before. And this is not a crowd to be modest with. So people can appreciate you. Let's get a little bit more of your bio and, and don't shortchange it because when I heard it, I was like, wow, this guy's been around. <laughs> I've been around. I've I feel the bruises. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll give a brief kind of summary of my background. I grew up in Texas, went to Texas A&M and uh, at an early age fell in love with the Latino culture just because of the nature of what I was exposed to and, and friends. Um, uh, got lucky uh, and got my, uh, my first job out of college was with the Federal Reserve Bank, and I was I was even more fortunate to work for a gentleman who at the time was the secretary of the Federal Open Market Committee. So I had a, a very interesting perspective of the, the management of money supply and the tools and mechanisms and levers that the Federal Reserve uses for that. Um, it didn't take me long to uh, develop a keen interest in derivatives. Um, and derivative trading. Uh, and I sort of restarted my career completely and moved to New York as a clerk on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange, which was the uh, largest commodity exchange in the world at the time. Uh, that's where oil uh, was traded. Um, later, we merged with uh, COMEX, and so we traded gold, silver, um, uh, base metals. And then... Um, we, we, I was able to uh, do some very interesting things um, as a trader and ultimately ended up being uh, asked to lead the, uh, the desk of the, the largest um, 
natural gas company really in the world at the time was called El Paso uh, El Paso Corporation, and they own the largest natural gas pipeline system in America. And so I was the head trader for them. And it, it was there where I really learned um, the impact of money and liquidity um, and, and some of the very sophisticated mathematics that drove uh, derivative trading. Um, uh, after I became head trader of uh, El Paso, I then was invited to join the board of NYMEX. And then they uh, nearly immediately asked me to become the president of NYMEX. And so th that began another uh, path in my life where uh, we, we were able to do really innovative, cutting edge things. So we created the world's first uh, over-the-counter clearing mechanism that was commercially successful. Um, that on the back of that, we were able to make uh, to drive NYMEX's valuation from 600 million uh, to uh, almost 3 billion. I put together a management buyout in a few years to buy NYMEX for 3 billion. Sadly, they turned me down, uh, and I guess they made a good decision because only two or three years later, they IPO'd for almost 14 billion dollars. They what later, yeah, yeah, it was it was a bittersweet moment. Yeah. Um, the uh, shortly after they IPO, they were bought by the CME. I went on and started uh, my life then, uh, which I had always kind of had as part of my life plan of being a serial entrepreneur. So I, I started and managed several hedge funds, high frequency trading, um, and and have incubated what I would call some innovative fintech businesses that include a partnership with CME that has launched the uh, world's first oil storage contract. So in the middle of all this uh, kind of noise and, and incubating businesses, I stumbled on the uh, Satoshi white paper in um, about, I would say about three months after uh, it was published. And I was fascinated. I was convinced uh, that this was the silver bullet that, that, that would save all of us poor mortals from uh, the obvious debasement that was going on in our currency. Um, but I also thought it, it could potentially be a fraud. So I studied it for a year. And it wasn't until I watched the price go from about five cents to $13 that I decided, well, I guess I should invest. I invested at $13 thinking that I would lose every dime I put into it just because I'd missed the rally. Little did I know. Um, so for a long time, I had, I had a, a, a mixed emotions about Bitcoin in that um, I, I saw it as this, the silver bullet that solved many problems in the same way that uh, most friendly users of it do. Um, but I also, coming from government and central banking, I, I understand the power and the weight of government. And I also understand how allergic they were naturally going to feel to this, this evolution. Um, now, some so people I, will be attracted to it because of that allergy. Like, you know, they yeah. sort of have a counter allergic response. But you're, you seem a little old school like me. <laughs> so, it's not so much that I'm old school is that I, I have intimate knowledge and detailed respect for the, the vastness of the existing monetary system. Mm. And, and, and it, it is not, if you look at the history of money and innovation in money, it moves at a snail's pace at best. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew enough to know that it would be an uphill battle for what I would call the, the mainstream economic actors to adopt Bitcoin without a long bumpy road and without the threat of the government turning it off essentially right. or shutting it down. And, mm -hmm. and people like to, in the early days, it, I, <clears throat> I called it Bitcoin was the anarchist dream. There was this view that um, it, it was, uh, I could evade taxes. I could, no one could ever shut me down. Um, <clears throat> you know, I can trade with anyone I want to in the world at the press of a button <clears throat> and, and it's anonymous and essentially not tracked. 
people have since come to learn that not only is that not completely the case, but but there's this little problem called an on-ramp. And at the time I was looking at Bitcoin when I first invested, the, the amount of money supply in the world of just US dollars, so no other fiat currency, was roughly $22 trillion. <clears throat> the last time I looked at that figure was, um, so that was uh, to put dates on it, that would have been about um, November of 2011, I believe. So by, by 2017, six years later, the, the, the same number I had analyzed before had now become almost $60 trillion. So instead of 22 trillion, we were swimming in $60 trillion of US currency issue. Now, how come I don't feel three times more wealthy? Exactly. In fact, you, you probably, you should feel three times poorer, right? Yeah. So um, depending on what you're invested in. So, the, um, uh, I, I never really felt like we were out of the woods, and quite frankly, I still don't, um, of having significant government interference um, that would be uh, co-opted by the money center banks. Um, but because in order for cryptocurrencies to actually play the role that people would envision for them, you have to convert at least a major portion of the mainstream economy to utilizing Bitcoin. And, and to do that, we, we had to go through the experiment of, uh, of, of the anarchist dream, if you will, of, of people saying, oh, trustless, uh, you know, I don't need to use an intermediary any, anymore. Thank God we, uh, we can kill all the hated banks. Only to discover that intermediaries actually played a role. And for the first time in my life, and maybe in since the turn of the century, the, uh, the 19th century, um, we had a real world uh, in your face exhibition of the value that custodians um, add to this process. Um, of course, having a custodian in the middle goes back to having a trusted relationship, which um, is untenable for some people. But um, for, for that big chunk of the mainstream economy that you want to capture and co-opt into a crypto system, you, you, you are only going to do that with a robust uh, intermediary um, system, at least as a transition, at a minimum as a transition. So um, this, let, let me pause here for a second. The, the, we're getting a little bit off track, but I'm gonna but 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 I'm gonna run with it. Okay. Do you think that because why not? That's what you get from being co-host. I, I I get to run with things. So do you think that the custodianship principle, functionality, facility, whatever you want to call it, can be equivalently created by saying smart contracts? or other automata, automata rather, such that the institutional role fades back and there's a technological solution to it that's adequate? So the short answer is absolutely. And, and so now, now what we're doing is instead of viewing trust as a binary event, we're viewing it as a, a gradient, right? And, and the gradient is solved through certain applications of technology like smart contracts. So the, num the number of, of items you can reduce in the trust equation, meaning I don't have to trust or depend on a human being to do something, then, then, then the more pure of a solution it is. But at the heart of it, at the ultimate heart of it is, and I'll, just, I'll use, uh, I'll use uh, a, a small business as an example that we deal with. We have a small business, it's a client of ours, it trades internationally. Quite frankly, it, it would be absolutely thrilled to use Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, um, except that it doesn't understand how to manage its own wallets. And so we're, we're in a teaching process with that client. Um, and it's not something that we are active and aggressive about, it's something that we're responsive to. So, so it could be that a client would use it, might use it, doesn't understand it, 
but most, most of all, they live in terror of losing their crypto, either by theft or by, you know, mismanagement of technology or what, whatnot. So, and, and, and it's exacerbated when you see someone who is sort of a godfather, if you will, in the crypto space, who knows a lot about the technology, lose $25 million worth of coin on his phone. So yeah, so, they're they're right for the grace of God. Go all of us. I, I got I've gotten sim swapped so many times. Yeah, but, exactly. But you know, here's a tip for everyone in the audience. You know, don't don't make your identity and your assets dependent on your cell phone number not getting ported. Yeah. You know, exactly. and it, luckily I've never had a loss, but it, you know, not on everything. But I've I've seen I've seen others, and they're right for the grace of God. Go a lot of us. Yeah. So it's a thing. So, but you know, but there, there there's also the insurance function. Yeah, you know, you, you, there's custodianship, and then there's insurance as well. Right. I, I think you know you said something interesting before, which is there's an on ramping process. I mean, part of the on ramping process is there there needs to actually be a ramp. And to the well, extent you have to, convert, you have to convert fiat to crypto. That's just step one. If you want, if you want the crypto ecosystem to mm -hmm. grow and uh, truly compete with, let's call it the legacy system of money. Mm. Um, there has got to be a conversion of that wealth from one system to the other. That's the on-ramp. And, and the U.S. government has made it just about as difficult as they possibly can to process that in both in implicit ways um, and explicit ways. Mm. So as an example, <clears throat> regulators have kind of put the fear of God into corresponding banks. Corresponding banks have almost a zero desire to touch any business that deals in crypto, mm -hmm. uh, including to, to deal with my own bank, which is regulated. And we've, you know, we uh, comply to bank secrecy act standards, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're actually a layer of defense that would make, banking the ultimate clients easier, but, but there, there is a serious allergy in the commercial banking world to uh, dealing with anyone in the crypto space at all. And, and occasionally we read a big headline like JP Morgan banking Coinbase. And that, that feels like progress and yippee, and we're all happy about it. But, but ask JP Morgan how many other crypto firms they're banking. Well, all right, now let, me, let me ask you, let me ask both of you something. The, um, to the extent that the EU's fifth money laundering director, directive, yeah, let me say this correctly. To the extent that the, you know, AMLD5, the fifth money laundering directive kicks in, and to the extent that the financial action task force recommendations kick in, and banks and financial institutions come into compliance with them, that, does that provide a level of comfort for banks and other financial institutions to start dealing with crypto and crypto companies? Uh, I'll share my opinion, which sure. is no. Uh, and and the, the, he, here's what lies at the heart of the issue. Um, when, when you're a compliance officer in one of these systems, your whole life is proving a negative. And which, you, as most of you know, is incredibly difficult to do. So, so you, you, your, your incentive program around your personal career is if you let something slip through and something bad happens, not, not only can you lose your job and potentially you know, stifle your career, you can serve time in prison. That's, that's currently how the laws are written. Mm -hmm. And so no compliance officer in the country has any incentive whatsoever to actually work hard, understand the technology, understand the ways that it's actually easier to catch bad guys. Um, they just don't have the incentive to do that. And, and nope. it's not something that you can compensate for. Meaning I can't as a client go in and say, well, uh, don't worry about your incentive. We'll pay your company an extra half million dollars. It won't matter. Oh yeah, sure. It looks like a bribe also. It's like, don't mind our little crypto business. Exactly. So, so the, we, we are struggling. I, I think the world of crypto is stuck in a holding pattern at the moment around 
challenges that relate to that the grand transition of call it money version two or three point oh into money version four point oh. Um, so let, let me pause you for a second. Yeah, no, what, Gio. what I was going to add, and, and just to make it, uh, and maybe to, to bring it back to Puerto Rico is, uh, I think Bo is mentioning it's an interesting, he's saying there's there's no incentive for the banks to do so, or market or whatnot, but um, when we have several jurisdictions, and, and I'm talking from a U.S. perspective, but at the that at local levels, will adopt their legislation and be welcoming to whether it be crypto banking or money transmission or to cryptocurrency in general, that will eventually force the hand of the federal government and the federal regulators because you're gonna have enough movement between the local jurisdictions. And while that doesn't have a lot of momentum yet, we see jurisdictions like, you know, Wyoming is mentioned a lot, but actually Puerto Rico, um, because, and, and a bank like Bose, um, the, the local regulator here for financial institutions does allow uh, the IFE vehicle to be used for uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, for cryptocurrency banking. There's only a handful of these, but there are. So maybe the, the, the compliance officer doesn't have the incentive, and they never will, because I agree with Bo, their, their job is basically to say no. Right. Um, I, I've sat down with compliance officers or compliance VPs of the local banks to try to explain to them what this is from a very, very earlier stage and, and use examples like, oh, Coinbase is FinCEN regulated or, or registered. Uh, so the money is already within the fence. You should be okay with that. From my perspective, they're they'll likely never gonna say yes. But when you build enough momentum from the the local community and you have a, a local jurisdiction that is welcoming, um, I think once that spreads along between states, and then the example you have is the, the cannabis industry, how the the federal regulators are hands off on the cannabis industry, but it all started with the states um, and local jurisdictions saying hands off and or, or, or actually being welcoming and regulating around it. Um, so enter Puerto Rico. Um, there has been legislation that has been proactive through the to the cryptocurrency and, and, and blockchain communities. So again, Wyoming, Puerto Rico, as always, Delaware, etc., and we continue to build that and be, be part of that, then um, they might not have an incentive, but we may actually be able to force their hand. Um, maybe it's the harder way to do it, but it, it is a way through. And there's also the international competition element. I mean, you know, you have countries, you know, Malta, Estonia, like they all, they all have their opportunities. They all have their problems. You know, none of them is clean. None of them is that bad if they're in the financial system. But you have yeah, these small the, jurisdictions trying to innovate here, and the U.S. is coming under pressure as a whole, like your point, internally and externally. I mean, I don't think we want to get behind, too yeah, behind internationally. Of course, I, I think so. And, and you know, and of course, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the right players will have to get involved um, or the big players to incentivize this. Um, to, 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 to take it to a level where you say it's exponential. But between now and then, um, I think there is opportunity. And obviously, we're being part of, of building this and the growth. Um, and it, it could take, uh, you know, I don't want to say generation, right? But it, it, it will take some time and it will take that hard work. But mm -hmm. um, we're definitely being a, a, a part of this. Again, co coming and then coming back to Puerto Rico, um, through whether it be regulatory legislation or write out incentives. Um, if you're a, a, in a foreign jurisdiction and you want to be in a U.S. jurisdiction or near a U.S. jurisdiction uh, or, or near a U.S. time zone to do business, then at least, you know, coming to Puerto Rico and transacting from Puerto Rico, you know, it's still, you know, you do, you get that um, quote unquote made in the USA stamp on, on your product. Um, 
but you have a, a little more uh, uh, um, of a jurisdiction that's a little more of an ally um, or a regulator that at least understands what you're doing, is trying to understand what you're doing and, and will, um, I don't want to say green light you, but at least give you the yellow, right, or the intermittent light to, you know, move along, do a little bit of this, and by the way, uh, be tax preferential while they're doing it. Uh, you know, I, I, I like the yellow light analogy. That, that works. All right, so I, I, I'm going to, I, I kind of went with it before, but now I'm going to grab the steering wheel and do a massive turn back onto the freeway. Um, Geo, for, for me and all other Puerto Rico neophytes, and there's a, there's a term I picked up from a prior show, which is tell, explain it to me like I'm five. So explain the 20 and 22 acts to me, everyone else, like we're five. And then I, I want you to tack on to the end of that, why they matter for non-US citizens also. Okay, but okay. Just, just, but give us, like I'm five, the 20 and 22 yeah. acts, what, what makes Puerto Rico awesome there? Yeah, uh, so 2022, and that's actually the old name, as well as Act 73 that I mentioned is also the old name. They're all packaged together in one single act called Act 60. Okay. Right. So everything I'll discuss is going to be really Act 60, but we'll still use the, the old uh, uh, names because uh, it's easier to segregate. Great. Um, what Act 22 does is it allows individual investors to have uh, tax-free capital gains uh, from trading, whether it's long-term or short-term, for gains accrued after they move to Puerto Rico. So you become a, a Puerto Rico resident investor and you trade and the capital gains you realize will be tax-free. Um, and then the same thing would happen for interest and dividends that can be sourced to Puerto Rico. So that's, I'm not gonna get into the technical aspect of the sourcing, but interest and dividends would also apply um, if they're sourced correctly. The that's 20, act, that's act 22. I'll, that's I'm 22. Okay. The individual investor, yeah. The 20 is for businesses. So businesses that establish to Puerto Rico, from Puerto Rico and export service to clients outside of Puerto Rico get a fixed 4% tax rate on their net uh, income. That's 4% so, of the gross, right? 4% net. 4% net. 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 Wow. Um, and that is for export is services. Okay. And that could be, yeah, could be... Um, consulting, marketing, professional services. I have clients that are law firms. Um, I have clients that are doing the back-end work of litigation in Brazil, that are doing the back-end work of litigation in the UK, all from Puerto Rico. And there's an intercompany services agreement that, of course, with you know a robust structure here, you will have um, those tax incentives. The, there is... Um, there's large companies like Microsoft, and you know I, I say this, if you look at the annual report for Microsoft, mm -hmm. they will have those footnotes there that say that the, they ha they, they're, the numbers they are showing reflect the lower tax bracket because the Microsoft Office products sold to the Americas are sold from Puerto Rico, are sourced here. The Office and, 365, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and it's interesting because Office used to be, you know, the CD, so they would manufacture that in Puerto Rico. The manufacturing was burning it onto the CD, and then they would sell a product. Mm -hmm. But when they moved to a software as a service model, because of the tax, the tax incentives played a lot to do with this, right? Because now you have a subscription, so you're receiving a service on your computer. And that service is effectively performed from Puerto Rico. And they're paying 4% tax on the net. And companies have similar models in Ireland or UK with Patent Box or um, in Hong Kong. You have similar setups as well. But all of those can interact with companies in Puerto Rico. And you can have potentially a trifecta of international operations. So why Puerto Rico is important is because a lot of the times you want to be in the U.S. Let's say for patent protection, mm. you want U.S. patent protection. But if you register in Delaware, you're going to pay 
U.S. taxes, which are on the corporate level, 21%. Here in Puerto Rico, U.S. patent law applies, but you don't get penalized with that high 21% rate at the corporate level or 37% rate at the individual level. Here in Puerto Rico, it's 4%. So, so sorry, let me ask you a question. Do, is it a common thing to establish an entity in Puerto Rico that's a subsidiary or sister entity of the main company just to hold the intellectual property and do the licensing? That's is what that Microsoft does as a corporation. I think if you're a large corporation, that would be the model that you would pursue. Mm -hmm. But if you're smaller, um, you might just do the whole thing in Puerto Rico or a Puerto Rico on a combination of foreign. I see what you're saying. But, yeah, but so correct. Really, you know that there, this actually applies directly to my my law practice. So I, you, know, you may be picking up some clients here. So if you have a client, if I have a client that has a patentable subject matter uh, product, you know, either software business method patent or otherwise, and they're U.S. based, just because they are here or because you know that's what's convenient or whatever, rather than running off to form them in Delaware. We should take a strong look at forming them in Puerto Rico. You know, of course, as absolutely, the, as an operational company and or a licensing entity. And you're saying, within a certain scale, it may simply make sense to have one op one one entity because you don't want to get too complex. So, yeah, Puerto because and the other is absolutely one is you know the tax rate you're going to be at, period, and two is potentially you might grow enough where you still want to move to Ireland. Right. And, and for, for any reason, um, if and, and take Facebook, for example, and Apple, um, Facebook is in a current litigation with the IRS because the IRS said that they undervalued their IP when they moved it from the U.S. to Ireland. Okay. So if you if you generate and grow your IP from Puerto Rico, there's no outbound tax from a U.S. perspective. Right. And for a Puerto Rico perspective, you're already working in incentivized model. So even if you move out, you transfer out it'll still cost you less. And again, you were able to, to, to develop within the protections uh, of US patent and trademark laws, right? And, and same thing for bankruptcy and, and, and other um, occupied fields uh, uh, for federal purposes. So again, you know, nearshoring or developing um, within the US, it, Puerto Rico is the go-to jurisdiction for that. So, um, I'm sorry, just so I know, what, what circuit is Puerto Rico in? I'm sorry? What, what circuit is Puerto Rico in? Do you know? First. First, first circuit. Okay. Makes sense. All right. And then, uh, and then, then just side note, do, do you see that Apple got acquitted of the Ireland taxes today or yesterday, the 13 billion euro? Ah, I didn't. I, I, I didn't see that. No. It, no. it just came out today. So Ireland will probably appeal, but Apple actually won, which is kind of shocking. But you're, you're right. I, I, I can see a, a blended strategy of now, based on what you're saying, Puerto Rico, potentially Ireland, you're right, potentially Hong Kong. And, yep. and, then, and then going back to um, maybe someone who, who to, to the individual, it's, it's kind of the same rationale. For some reason, you want a visa, you want a green card, or you even want to become a U.S. citizen. Well, that costs taxes. But if you naturalize through Puerto Rico, a different set of rules apply. So now you're a U.S. green card holder where you, you, the, the, the U.S. taxation would have applied, but if you're a Puerto Rico resident while being a U.S. green card holder, it's Puerto Rico resident, the, the Puerto Rico tax rules that apply. So for immigration purposes, you've complied, mm -hmm. but for tax purposes, it's costing you less. Same thing with the, the eight-year rule, right? Because if you, you exit after eight years under certain uh, um, temporary immigration status, well, you would have to pay those unrealized capital gains. Well, you're Puerto Rico, they're sourced here. So, so you would you know, apply a strategy where it doesn't cost you. So, so it's, it's interesting both for companies and for individuals that you know, want that US relationship for some reason. All right, I, I, I'm gonna challenge you slightly, but you can then put me in my place. So is Puerto Rico a popular, two questions, is Puerto Rico a popular EB-5 investor visa destination? And for our audience, that's basically, I can get, it's what it sounds like. You can invest a certain amount of money in an approved project and get 
What was it? Is it non-immigrant status here? Is that the right way to say it? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a golden visa, right? Okay, um, okay, thank you. Sorry, let me ask part two, and then and then then go for it. And then number two is to to what extent do these wealthy immigrants or non-immigrant visa seekers park their assets out of the side of the U.S. before coming in? in some more neutral jurisdiction. And then go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So um, Puerto Rico is an EB-5 jurisdiction um, in in territory limits. I would say basically the, the whole island is a, a, a region itself. Um, there are a handful of projects. One is, uh, and I think the most popular one that has been um, getting contributions for some time is a Four Seasons uh, Hotel opening on the east of the island. Um, next to the largest marina in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely not Miami. <laughs> South Florida is definitely a larger EB-5 jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the capital contribution requirement in Puerto Rico is lower. They, they tweaked that, and now I think it's a 800K in, in most jurisdictions in the main U.S. And mm -hmm. here we're still at 500, so it's a little lower. Um, really? That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, and so that's a, that's a reality. There's also a project in the south uh, east of the island that is a newer project. It's a large hotel project that is, is looking for, for major funding, a uh, beautiful hotel project that they're going to do. So there is a lot of EB-5 opportunity, but again, uh, honestly, it's not, you know, Miami is, is a, a lot of a hotter spot for that. And it, it is what it is. Um, uh, from what I've heard, the thing is that a lot of the projects in Miami had already been started and then became uh, EB-5 projects, basically. So it was easy to buy in and right. have the employment requirements uh, very quickly run up. Not so much the case here. Here we have projects that are actually looking for the funding to ramp up. Uh, <laughs> and that's just that's just insight that I've, I've heard. You know, I, I can't take that for a fact either. Um, it, 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 it actually, you know, never mind the second problem. My question was unnecessarily provocative, but with the, with the 22 Act for the in, individual investor, you said upon achieving residency, if I heard you correctly, these benefits kick in. W what is the process to achieve residency in Puerto Rico? So uh, there's there's many methods. The most common way is to have uh, to be present in the island for 153 days, uh, 183 days. I'm sorry. Um, I mentioned 153 because you actually get an allowance for 30 days to be in, in foreign countries that count as Puerto Rico days. So if you're not in Puerto Rico, not in the U.S. for 30 days, those count as Puerto Rico. Got That's it. the most common way to do it, minimum. But I have a lot of clients that are digital nomads that are basically nowhere and, and, and everywhere. And there are provisions that say that if you stay – for less than 90 days in the U.S., in the mainland U.S., for less than 90 days, then you don't actually have a Puerto Rico minimum. So you can be traveling the world for the rest of the year, and, and, and Puerto Rico still being your home base, where you mm -hmm. still have your, your main residence here and your banking account uh, here and um, other things like insurance and having a driver's card and a, 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 a driver's license and a voter's card in Puerto Rico. Having all these, those things done here, um, even – while being a digital nomad around the world, if you're in the U.S. less than 90, then you, you still comply with um, the presence test, right? So, so it's a combination of ways to do it. But uh, again, normally most common minimum here for 183 days, having a home here for the entire year. So you, you do have to to lease a home, and after two years you have to purchase a home here. Have to purchase. After two years. Okay. Yep. Um, and, and then there's, uh, some charitable donation requirements, uh, $10,000 a year in, uh, to charity for the individuals that doesn't apply to the business. That's only for the individuals. And then, um, and then government fees and filings and whatnot. Uh, but you know, it is, it is a very beneficial program because it is, you know, no tax on cap gains again, short term or long term. So if you're a day trader, if you you know if you're a, a high frequency trader, normally um, jurisdictions would charge that at ordinary rates here. Yes. Zero. Wow. So explain, and I guess this is for both of you, but Geo start off and then both jump in also. I, I I think 
I think it's a mixed situation. I think part of the attraction for the crypto community of Puerto Rico was this tax situation. Uh, is a lot of people who found themselves suddenly wealthy or anticipated becoming suddenly wealthy and saw what was coming in terms of their tax bill and did some strategic relocation to Puerto Rico. And I think then they either back rationalize it as, wow, we're really interested in this island and supporting it and everything else, or they uncovered what was always there that they had done for personal reasons, but then kind of saw the bigger picture once they were present and on the ground. Can you talk about the interaction between the tax acts and the crypto community and how it got founded there, you know, from the first pioneers that you mentioned going forward and how it's sort of become an ecosystem on its own? Yeah, I, I guess I can kind of start and then Bo can jump in with his experience because um, I think he, he's part of that, um, you know, uh, of that experience. So, um, yeah, like I said, you know, early on, I think there were some people that were interested a little bit from the tax perspective, but also from what you could do from, from here. Um, it's interesting because in that 2014 case, um, the Commissioner of Financial Institutions back then and that administration, he had greenlit the deal. So, so in, in very early on, you, you had a regulator that says, yes, this, this can be done. You know, mm -hmm. so, so again, it was for lack of the investor, but that, that backed out. Um, but the, the, the regulation was favorable or beginning to be favorable at that time. And then uh, you had people that, yes, you know, began to, to realize they, they would become uh, um, wealthy or, you know, that there was an opportunity here. Um, and, and I saw, like I said, I saw that practice grow from, you know, no clients, but, you know, from 2014 to 2017, you know, probably maybe had two dozen clients that were in the crypto space. I would say that before the ramp up, there was already a realization of mm -hmm. what was happening and what could be done here. Um, one thing we did, and this was around 2015, 2016, was we had an Act 20 company that was going to do what was then known as an ICO mm -hmm. because they had a utility token. Um, we the, the, the blockchain wasn't included in the law, right? But we yeah. we explained to the government how the, the, the sale of a utility token was tied to a service. And they granted this Act 20 grant, this Act 20 decree to this company, uh, which was the first one, first ICO technically, that would have been uh, issued um, as an Act, Act, Act 20. And, and there was an interesting tax problem for ICOs back then that the, the people selling the ICOs didn't understand that when you sold the ICO, you were precisely pre-selling or selling a service that was mm -hmm. ordinary income. They were seeing it as, oh. as, as when you sell stock. Was, well, it's, well, if you sell, if you want to treat it like a stock, you have to give away equity. If you're not giving away equity, you're selling a service. You know, it has to be somehow a taxable event. They didn't realize it back then. Well, actually, um, I'm just interesting. So one thing I always tell my clients is, do yourself a favor, pay at least some tax on the tokens you're selling, because that is a nice argument that they're not securities. Because if you fail to pay taxes because you're saying, you know, it's not a good or a service, you just handed the SEC and everyone else an argument that's a security. Correct. Correct. Very correct. So for, so tying in Puerto Rico was very interesting back then because it was, you were doubling down on, this is so much a service that I have a, a jurisdiction that has given me, a, you know, a decree. I have a contract for providing or pre-selling the service through this. So, so that was a very interesting ramp up. Again, um, and, and then, you know, things change from a regulation standpoint and, and everybody still thinks utility tokens are, or I think the majority has, has deviated away from the, 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 the utility token um, project. Um, I, I have my own opinion on that. I, I think, you know, it's still worth giving the fight. But, but anyways, uh, from a Puerto Rico perspective, that's what, he, that's what happened. And a lot of people came here. And then, obviously, we had that. 2017, 2018 ramp up. Um, it was interesting. The first uh, uh, Coin Agenda conference we had here, and it was uh, in, in 2016. There was almost no no people, um, and when we started talking about tax, everybody left the room. And then you know, come one, two years. That's later, exactly when they should have st sat down and started taking notes. Yeah, no, a... they laughed. They didn't care. And, and um, I think uh, that ties in with what Bo said earlier. You know, the, the anarchist dream, right? It's not mm -hmm. really. And they, as they came to realize that, 
uh, Puerto Rico became uh, uh, more and more attractive to them. So um, let, me, and then, let, me stop, let me stop you for a second. Bo, you know, talk to us about, I mean, you're, it, 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 I mean, you're, you're like a mainland USA kind of guy, at least in your early days, but here you are in Puerto Rico making your moves, you know, doing a bank. You know, how, how did you get pulled in and then how did you integrate, what, what's, your, what's your view of the interaction between Puerto Rico's sort of native capabilities, the tax situation, crypto, and, and how things have developed? Um, so to put it like in the historical framework, I moved here in December of 16, uh, largely related to other businesses I had incubated in derivative trading that had accumulated a lot of gains. Uh, and so I, I was keenly interested in uh, the tax advantages. However, the second I really set foot here, um, fell in love with um, a lot of things about Puerto Rico, not almost all of them. Um, so I, I didn't move here through the lens of crypto. Um, and in fact, even though I was investing and trading in crypto, I was, um, I was trading much bigger positions in oil and, and some other commodities. So, um, you know, I did a deep dive on the application of the, the laws as they set forth and uh, Geo hit on a few things that I think are really important for people to understand. And one of which is the application of the incentive programs are incredibly specific, meaning the, the, there, is a, there is a bad habit amongst marketers about the benefits of Puerto Rico mm. that I don't think are intentionally misleading, but they're, they're definitely misleading. So, so if you ever read, for instance, like, you know, interest earnings are tax free. Well, th th there's about 42 more sentences that have to go with that, that statement to make it accurate. Um, and so, as we dug in, we started realizing that like there are some things that, that, that from a tax perspective are perfect about Puerto Rico and there's others that are complicating, but in the end, the benefits are just, are just extraordinary. Um, I, I, my experience moving to Puerto Rico was less about crypto um, and it was, it was more about what I would call traditional um, you know, trade structuring or um, hedge fund structure. Um, it, it, but but it, it turned out, I believe, that especially in the new lay 60, that crypto is treated like an adult class of assets vis-a-vis -vis Puerto Rico tax law. And I think that's something people should be inspired about. I like how you framed it. Now, for what, what's your sense of the so beyond beyond your personal experience, you're interacting heavily with the local business community, and sort of this new entryist crypto community that came there maybe for this or that reason, but is now engaging with Puerto Rico as Puerto Rico. What, what's your sense of the community as it's developing? Just you know, it's a broad question, but give me give me whatever pops to mind and your sense of it. Well, what you, you're seeing, I believe you're starting to see some of the knock-on effect that you would hope to see and sort of the economic development is initiatives. I, I have the luxury of serving on a board um, called Invest Puerto Rico, whose mission is to recruit foreign investment, essentially, and job creation in Puerto Rico um, by communicating and marketing and um, uh, explaining the incentive programs that exist here. And, and they are, by the way, vast. Um, and I, I still believe that uh, we are only scratching the surface on utility um, around these um, mechanisms. So, right. so one, one of them that I would encourage people to look at, especially in the tech sector, and Geo can speak to this with much more expertise than me, but um, is Act 73, well, formally Act 73 incentive programs, which is research and development that allows you to receive a tax credit for up to 50% of the software development dollars that you invest in locally. Wow. So if I hire a team of 10 coders in Puerto Rico and I develop 
software that I can license outside of Puerto Rico, I receive a 50% rebate for the investment I made in those salaries. In addition to the tax- Wait, Am I hearing that correctly? Half of your salary expense is reimbursed? Correct. Yeah, yes. half of your expenses into R&D, also in equipment, right? If you need to buy specialized equipment for that R&D, um, that is- Are, are, are these equipment. essentially credits? Yeah, they're credits. Yeah, those are, these are tax credits that you can sell. You can, they, they're transferable once, so you can, you can either consume them yourself or sell them, and they go for about 90 cents on the dollar. Yes. So it's a nice cash back, you know? Um, so yeah, and, and, and this year they traded for uh, a premium to the dollar. Why? Because the treatment of the tax credit dates back to when the tax credit was issued. So if you were somehow delinquent in taxes or had a surprise, it's worth more for you to buy that tax credit than it is to not buy it and pay a penalty. It's complicated, but but that's beautiful. Especially yeah. for a lot of crypto people. Right. So, so the, the, but my point is almost nobody knows about that incentive plan because it was, it was intentionally, it was originally intended to be around R&D for manufacturing. But they've included technology in it. So, so it, it means you can run a development, a, a tech development program in Puerto Rico at half, at half the Puerto Rican cost which is already probably 80% of the mainland cost. Amazing. And, and then Gio, there, correct me if I'm wrong, there, there is a federal R&D credit available as well, or did that sense that? There are some federal credits, um, and in some cases they could be combined. There's, uh, again, we're within the US jurisdiction, so uh, a lot of credits out there, actually, you know, including, let's say, opportunity zones or, or whatnot. Um, you, you anticipate my next question, but go ahead. Yeah, I know that Puerto Rico is 98.5% of the island is in opportunity zone jurisdiction and it applies here. So you can combine gains from the US, invest them into Puerto Rico and you know that could be part of your move. Opening Puerto Rico businesses is, it could be an opportunity zone play. Um, and there are some limitations on how these interact, but there are also correct ways to, to have uh, local incentives and federal ones interact. Interesting. So S Sonder is got his own large following. And of course he's, you know, this is show is powered by Iconic, which is a, a fund, a crypto fund out of the Netherlands for a non U S audience where, where we may be speaking a little bit of Greek, so, so to speak. <laughs> um, you know, if you're coming from the Netherlands and you are a business person, and you're trying to make sense of how all these U.S. and local tax rules apply to you, what, w what would you say to them? Well, like I, I mentioned earlier, um, if you do U.S. business, you already know that, that if you already do business in the U.S., uh, you, you know that you have some tax consequences. This Puerto Rico is a way to minimize that. But I think it, where, where it becomes important is if you're going to plan on doing business in Puerto Rico, in the U.S. If you want a near shore, if you want to have- uh, Okay, I see what you're saying. You're right, you did mention that before. So it's not specifically that you're gonna hunt out of Puerto Rico in a vacuum. It's more like you have operations in the U.S. or looking at operations in the U.S. or you somehow touch the U.S. And of course, the moment you touch the U.S., you also touch the U.S. taxes. Well, now, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me, okay. let me, there are certain jurisdictions and this goes by jurisdiction. But certain jurisdictions that are territorial and don't tax you on worldwide income, you want to move outside of wherever you live and, and look for one of these tax preferential jurisdictions because you receive distributions from the Puerto Rico company and your own jurisdiction will say, well, you know, if it didn't happen here, we're not taxing you on that. So mm -hmm. it's 4% here and there's no tax on the distribution from Puerto Rico or the U.S. for that matter. And if your country doesn't tax you, then... Uh, and you're that's good, beautiful. right? Yeah, that's beautiful. But that'll be dependent on whether you live in a jurisdiction which is worldwide taxation or whether it's territorial, right? And and I know a lot of European countries are, are territorial. Um, so, so, yeah. 
in my mind, I don't know. I don't know who's worldwide other than the U.S. That that's big. Um, I I don't want to be wrong, but I think the U.K. is is worldwide as well. God, God bless imperial system. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess we I guess we inherited that. L lucky us. Um, all right. So let me let me take the conversation to. Puerto Rico, let's just say straight out, has some sort of branding issue. It's kind of odd. And I don't know whether it was warranted, is warranted, or something, but let's 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 talk about the reality. Let's talk about what some people think. What's the reality? Where was it and where is it going? And just kind of hit it straight on. So Gio, I'll throw this to you first, but I'd like you both to just you know just have at it. Yeah. Um, um... There's, there's a lot of things, and, and where it's been, again, tying it to the blockchain, there has been an evolution where we had, you know, probably welcoming, then some issues, and, and some things that seemed concerning, but then legislatively it was corrected, and I think um, that was missed to make a lot of noise and a lot of news where Puerto Rico actually proactively, just last year, approved legislation that, you know, does mention blockchain, does mention uh, cryptocurrency you know it's it's right there it's very clear so i i think that was missed um from a general political standpoint you know uh, i said geo you're being a little pc be, be a little bit more specific if you don't mind sorry and i and i read some of the articles too there's a new york article new york times article a couple of years ago that was not entirely pleasant and i thought it was a little bit off base i actually kind of re re response to it yeah. Well, um, is, is it fair, is it fair to say that there was a local perception that these crypto people were like, you know, saw themselves as above the system or saviors or something that produced some local resentment? But I think that was a little bit blown up by the media and things are on a more productive. I think the, I think the resentment was blown up. I think the resentment was blown up by, by the, the the article wasn't factually correct, not not the New York Times one and and not the GQ one mm -hmm. either. Um, they weren't factually correct um, because of, you know, the what and the where and who's here, but also the, the backlash from the local community itself. You know, there, there are some political realities in Puerto Rico here that, that exist regardless of crypto and, you know, it's uh, mentalities that are on where the island should go on economic development and use of natural resources and kind of the same political debate you might have in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, these tax incentives, because they invite investors and they invite wealthy people to come here, you know, they, they hit right in the, in, in the heart of someone that has, you know, certain uh, uh, political or economical beliefs, right? It's like, wait, we're pushing yeah, for... You're, like you're right. They're perfectly designed to bring in the kind of people that those people would resent. Yeah. So the, that <laughs> but that yeah. resentment, you would... I think it's, it's more blown up than the reality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to a certain point, um, there, there's only about 3,000 investors that have moved in the, to the island. Mm -hmm. So that's actually not a lot. Um, and that's over an eight-year span. You know, we want it to be a lot more than that. So, so it, it, it is. And by the same token, you know, these programs have created jobs. It's estimated, you know, that's between ten and 15,000 uh, direct jobs. And actually, I say estimated, but that, that's actually reported, which is also not a lot, right? But mm -hmm. it is positive. So, you know, when you say, well, you've relocated about 1,500 businesses that have created 15,000 jobs, um, you know, it, it's the numbers depends on how you look at them and say, well, it's not a lot, but a, a lot of this is small businesses that have five to 10 employees. Some have one, two, three, um, you know, so, so it varies. The, the, the effect has definitely been net positive. And I think you have more of that than an actual pushback. Uh, and there always will be pushback from certain sectors. And the, the, the way you prove that and how you see that is, again, how the eventual legislation ended up being inclusive of the program. So maybe while it was discussed on whether crypto would be included or excluded in a revision of the law, and it seemed it was going to be excluded in an early stage, you saw how that was reverted and, and was approved. So I think that actually shows what the majority perception is. Mm -hmm. Although, yes, 
it will get you know some some noisy backlash, but I don't think that backlash is the, the reality. And as just be blunt, I mean, you know, Puerto Rico doesn't. If, you, if you're a mainland USA person like myself, Puerto Rico doesn't sort of like emerge in your. Puerto Rico didn't emerge into my consciousness until I became aware of crypto. And then, of course, you know, you had the hurricanes, the earthquakes, and all that other stuff. So, you know, that, that's sort of how it plays on the news. Um, n- now, hopefully, I'm getting a little bit more nuanced just because I've been there and spoken to people like you and, you know, trying to get into it. But for your, I mean, you know, dare I say the mainland USA is largely ignorant of Puerto Rico and, and what it offers. It, it, it's not necessarily a branding issue. It's maybe a little bit of lack of brand. How, how, how do you... How do you break through into the consciousness of the people that you want to break through to when they're, when they're not looking for it? Well, I think um, the news reports and articles have been good. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a local promoter program that is private companies uh, that are supposed to promote these incentives. Um, I think it's, that program is not where it should be yet. Um, and then there's a company that, or, or not the company, the organization that Bo mentioned, he sits in the board of. I think that's that has become their, their job and their goal, and that's what they're ramping up to, to be able to do um, from an education standpoint. Fair enough. Now, Bo, I mean, you're, you're a little bit like me. You started mainland, and then you learned so much and got so involved. Tell us about that and how you see Puerto Rico can, can kind of break through and let everyone know what it offers. Well, I, I, I took a view that coming to Puerto Rico, by definition, involved um, – the humility of of learning someone else's culture and um, and be and 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 trying to be very respectful and careful in uh, in in adapting to them rather than bowling in and expecting it to all be just like the mainland U.S. or for that matter any other direction and and that is my strong advice to to any gringo for the lack of a better term. Uh, that that comes to Puerto Rico is to take the time to get to know the people, the process, the history of why things are the way they are, um, and, and you'll you'll quickly discover that there's there's good reason for funny things that we may not uh, properly handicap. So so with that being said, um, I, I believe in being involved in your community wherever you live. And um, I've, I've done so wherever I've lived, in New York, Texas, uh, even overseas. Um, and I think Puerto Rico is uniquely positioned uh, for Americans especially um, to provide a wonderful lifestyle in a culture that's friendly and welcoming, um, that has um, – the it, it is not so insular institutionally that uh, that new businesses and projects can't get off the ground here quite easily. And, and there's a lot of hidden secrets about Puerto Rico too that people just don't talk about as much as they should. But I, I'll give you one that I find remarkable, and that is the internet infrastructure. Mm-hmm. That, by that I mean the the wholesale, large scale internet infrastructure in Puerto Rico is quite spectacular. It's better than any jurisdiction I've ever lived in my life. And um, th- that's not spoken about as often as it should be because people confuse what's going on at, at, at a institutional level around technology versus a retail level of, oh, I want to get on Dish TV and you know, do whatever. So, so there's some advantages that like that. The cost of living is fantastic. I don't have to tell you guys how great the weather is. Um, and... Um, culturally, it's a rich place. So w- w- I know me and my family will go um, spend a day squarely in the middle of a mountain range um, mm-hmm. doing nothing but hanging out. And and it's totally fascinating only next weekend to go to a beach area or to go to you know, a biozone or the, the, for, for the size of the island, the quality of life here, I think is spectacular. So that's, that's actually one thing I discussed with Pedro. The, it's, that's often what's said about California, but of course California is much bigger, is that you, you can have one moment you're up in the mountains with snow, the next moment you're in something semi-tropical, then you're in Redwoods, then you're on the beach. You're, right. you're saying Puerto Rico has that, but obviously even 
are more accessible because it's smaller size. I mean, you can literally go from ecosystem to ecosystem in, in hours or in an hour. That, that, right. yeah, that's amazing. And the other thing, not to, to be diminished, and, and this is in flux at the moment, but a big reason I moved here was the um, international travel was really easy. Uh, I could, with the exception of the West Coast, and this is something I hope we begin working on, but with the exception of the West Coast, I could be almost anywhere in America in less than four hours. In, anywhere that I needed to be commercially, Chicago, New York, Boston, mm. um, t uh, Dallas, Houston, uh, obviously any, anywhere in the Southeast is pretty easy. That, that is a big deal in, in a world that was glued together by uh, human contact. Um, I don't know what's gonna come of that now, but Puerto Rico was, for, if, if you compare to probably everywhere but Chicago, Puerto Rico had a much better travel nexus than almost anywhere else in America. It's, it's interesting that you say anywhere but Chicago as opposed to saying anywhere but New York. Um, well, New, New York, New York has a good one also, but but it is you know to go from uh, New York to uh, pick your poison, Denver, Colorado, right? Is I think a six-hour flight. So there, there, there. The reason I've mentioned Chicago is because it's squarely in the center of the country, and pretty right. much three four hours are everywhere. Um, but but the, the the other part too is New York is very far from Latin America, obviously. Yes. Um, and, and in Asia. Advantage. Of Gordon and Bo, I I have got this question that that or I missed it or it hasn't been asked yet, but I'm really curious because I'm excited when, when I get the info from from you guys, Bo uh, and, and and Giovanni also, of course. So, how come this all sounds that like this is one of the best kept secrets? around what, what, what is the main reason for that because it, all the things you're saying sounds really logical and i'm thinking oh, oh shit we need to move our business there you know this is how we can enter the the u.s market and i'm thinking how come most people common people just ordinary people like you and me don't know about what i call uh, one of the best kept secrets what, what's the reason on that i mean i can share my gringo viewpoint <laughs> and, please uh, I, I think that um, this is this is really sad. But Puerto Rico is uniquely discriminated against in in the, in the United States, particularly in New York, mm -hmm. um, and uh, for that matter, possibly Chicago and other places. Mm -hmm. And so, if, if you think about when Puerto Rico shows up in the news cycle, and over the last well, since I've lived here. Um, we've had two, actually, two hurricanes mm -hmm. that, that were major that actually hit the island. Um, we had, uh, the, the, we essentially had a governor deposed uh, who, you know, resigned. We've had, um, resigned. yeah, we've had, um, you know, the, the mayor of San Juan being very noisy and rank, rancorous in the uh, last election cycle. Mm -hmm. um, you you have had earthquakes now. You have had um, now we're in the middle of a drought, um, and all, all along the way you have sort of one scandal of a, after the other um, that involves some form of sort of government corrupt corruption. Those are the stories that make the front page of the news of the mainstream news mm -hmm. outlets. Primarily because they're the ones that will get re read the most. It, 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 and let's just face it, you know, bad news is something people like to read. So um, what, what is missing are quality of life issues. I, I do think people are intimidated by the, the, the misconception that it, it is a Spanish-speaking country only. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of you here would agree with me that you can get by quite fine uh, with only English. Although I see it as a great opportunity to try to learn Spanish, I'm, I'm working my Spanish every day. Um, the uh, and 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 so the messaging that gets out between layers of sort of uh, literally racial discrimination, 
mm -hmm. um, a poor view of what Puerto Rico is relative to these new articles. It, bar it buries the lead that, wait, there's a great quality of life here, um, fantastic climate, great business environment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it, because those things require, they're not exciting and exhilarating to read about. Um, and, and people typically don't dig in and, and do the work. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we underestimate how difficult it is to ask families to just pick up and change where they live. And, and, and probably there's a bias in the crypto space because there's a cognitive bias. If you're in crypto, you have already demonstrated that you have the propensity to try new things. Yeah. Right. And, and live on the, on the bleeding edge. I can assure you that is a unique and rare quality amongst most human beings. Mm -hmm. And so w walking in, we've had these conversations with people we've tried to recruit through you know, our bank. We can walk in, we can give them the, the entire full on sales pitch, but the reality is they've got three kids in school at a neighborhood they've been at for 15 years and they're not going to do anything for four or five years. And that, that, that's just the friction of life. Well, Bo, let me ask you, do you ever fly them down and show them? And yeah, get it, and what, what do you, what's the reaction? So in, I'll tell you what I do that I recommend. I, I've worked out corporate hotel deals um, in Puerto Rico. Um, again, this is pre-COVID. So everything now is kind of up in the air. But pre-COVID, we worked out corporate rates with local hotels. And, and the, the trade-off I made with people, not just people I'm trying to recruit, but any business meeting I had, is if you will come visit me between November and June in Puerto Rico for our business meeting, I'll pick up your hotel. And you, it is the most wonderful tactic I've ever deployed on both making my life simple, uh, but also exposing people to a fantastic uh, environment. And it's a very, very positive experience. Makes sense. Um, now, I, I wouldn't recommend it, um, you know, August through October. <laughs> But the hurricane season is not ideal. You're like the guy showing the apartment when, when, the, when the train's not running. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's great. It's quiet. Neighbors are perfect. And then, yeah, I, I got it. Um, the, tell us a little bit of, you know, it relates to the branding issue. Tell us about your bank, the name change. This, yeah. You know, well, so the that change, I mean, this goes back to what I believe is just sort of like, legacy bigotry which is um we are we i mean as a financial institution that is highly regulated we are discriminated against because we are in puerto rico there, there is a perception and, and this is a very small niche this does not apply i think in most other sectors but in in the sector called banking th there is a viewpoint that we are um, it's, it, it's an incorrect viewpoint, by the way. There's, there's a misperception that we are a money laundering haven, um, more, more so than any other jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth of the matter is just not the case. Um, if you look at our, our data and our statistics, they, they look similar to any other. We're regulated by the U.S. financial system. We, we, our bank audit is the same FDIC handbook uh, application that any other bank in the United States has to apply uh, or abide by. So um, what, what, where I see one of the points of pain in Puerto Rico is if you're trying to build and develop a financial institution, um, particularly in banking proper, um, you will run into a buzzsaw of uh, uh, stereotypes that are unfair, in my opinion. So we felt like we'd be better off as it relates to the bank itself to, to draw, it used to be called San Juan Mercantile Bank and Trust. It is, it is now currently just called Mercantile Bank International. Um, and and the, the simple dropping of our reference to San Juan from a bank only perspective 
has been uh, beneficial. They still know that we're in Puerto Rico, but it becomes less of a um, poke you in the eye kind of a issue. And I'm sad to say that we chose the name because we wanted to be a proud leader of, uh, of, of helping the financial system here in Puerto Rico grow. It's just going to take a little longer than we originally planned. Fair enough. And you know, and you and I were talking about it, like Estonia with Danza Bank, it's, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? $220 billion of money was laundered through a Euro system bank. And, yeah. and, and yet you, the, someone in Europe will sit and if you're a banker and, you know, turn your nose up in Puerto Rico, like it's some rogue jurisdiction. Um, we have, you know, I, I try to be fair and balanced and not just present a, a purely rosy view of Puerto Rico, but um, the, the, it, it is unjustly uh, discredited um, because of the laziness of people and, and, and it's, it's one of the marketing issues we're going to have to overcome as, uh, as a community. Well, hopefully because of shows like this and guests like you and crypto and everything else, we have an opportunity to bring, like Sandra said, one of the best kept secrets to a wider audience. I mean, I'm, I personally found this fascinating. I, I thought your comments were all well taken. I, I like the real, the realness of it and the component. Um, and, you know, as, as soon as, you know, this global pandemic dies down a little bit, I look forward to revisiting Puerto Rico and seeing you all. Uh, and I, and also, uh, yeah, also Gordon, because I've never been in Puerto Rico b because of, you know, a thousand different reasons. And one of them was, you know, I, I heard stories through the grapevine, but what I've heard so far, this, I, and I think I'm not the only one who's, who's listening to a, whatever Bowen and Giovanni saying. I think this is a real good opportunity for people to investigate themselves by experience themselves outside of hurricane season. That's what, that's what I've heard to discover what, what's, this 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 uh, opportunity, this best kept secret, can can mean for themselves as an individual, or also for their business. So I think this is a really uh, valuable uh, Crypto Wednesday show where we learned a lot from Bo and, and and Gio, and I hope a lot of people are inspired. And if they are, you know, if they want to follow up or get some more info, then they should reach out to us, to Bo, to Gio. Uh, and I'll say we'll, we'll put in the show notes references, including to Bo. You mentioned the uh, Invest Puerto Rico website so we'll uh, I, I, shame on me i think it's uh, uh ipr.org oh yeah it, it's okay we, we're, we haven't put we haven't posted the fully recorded version on youtube yet so oh. we'll, 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 we'll put it up on the show notes we'll distribute it to our telegram group and we'll provide additional resources for people to sort of reach these professionals get involved learn more and form their own points of view so i think we can go from there um I think we should thank our guests. You know, thank you, Bo. Thank you, Gio. Thank you, Sounder. You're not a guest, but you're awesome. Uh, and thank you, Luke, hiding behind the iconic icon. Luke is our production lead, just the genius with the laptop making making it all happen. So, Sounder, are we are we good? Yeah, I, I think we're good. I think today's show was really good. So, uh, uh, on behalf of Gordon and myself, Bo, towards you and towards Gino, Gio, and everybody that's watching or watching the recording. Thank you for attending. Share the good news. Share the video with your blockchain and crypto industry friends. Like and subscribe. Yeah, like and subscribe. That, that's what we, what we like. Yeah. Because it's all about sharing. So thanks, everybody, for, for today's show. Also, again, thank you, Iconic Digital Asset Management, for powering the show, for making things happen. Really appreciate that. We look forward to seeing you all on next week. Same time, same place, same link and another Crypto Wednesday show. So for now, thank you all, have a good day, and we'll see each other later. Bye everyone, bye.